Once upon a time, there was a professional wrestling company that changed the entire industry, and they did so by going to the extreme. Hailing from the House of Hardcore, it featured a roster full of misfit toys, all led by the mad genius of professional wrestling. And even though they were only around for a mere seven years, their name can still be heard chanted in arenas everywhere. What is this amazing company? Well, sit back and relax, because this is the history of Extreme Championship Wrestling. A quick shout out to all of my awesome Patreon supporters, such as Baba Yega, Jeremy P, and Jeff Ang. Thank you so much for the support, it really does mean a lot. Extreme Championship Wrestling started off as Eastern Championship Wrestling. But what some of you might not know is that before that, Eastern Championship Wrestling actually began as the Tri-State Wrestling Alliance, the TWA. Not to be confused with Tri-State Wrestling, which was created by Leroy McGurk, something I already covered in a previous video. The TWA was formed in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in 1989 by Joel Goodhart, who brought in a local pawn shop owner as his partner. Todd Gordon. Three years later, in 1992, Goodhart would sell his share to Todd, who would then go on to rename the company Eastern Championship Wrestling. Although, the Tri-State Wrestling Alliance moniker would be revived again briefly in 2009 up until 2011. Now, during the initial changeover to ECW, the promotion was not a part of the National Wrestling Alliance, at least not yet. It wouldn't be until 1993 that things would begin to pick up. ECW would officially join the NWA, and Gordon would name Hot Stuff Eddie Gilbert as his head booker, who was also able to secure a local TV deal. However, in September of that same year, Gordon and Gilbert would have a falling out, resulting in Todd needing to find a new partner. And he did so with a then recently released WCW manager named Paul Heyman. Then the following year, and things would go through some dramatic changes yet again. As mentioned in a previous video, Jim Crockett Jr. would sell his company to that of Ted Turner, who turned the whole thing into WCW. As for Crockett himself, well, he would have a non-compete clause with World Championship Wrestling, which was just about to run out, and after it did, he would return to the NWA. And knowing a good thing when he saw it, Crockett approached Todd about holding a tournament for the now vacated NWA World Championship. You see, while WCW still had their hands on the physical title belt, the promotion itself had just withdrawn from the alliance, and therefore the NWA decided to vacate the championship. So Crockett and Gordon had a plan for the tournament to take place in Philly, however the NWA president at the time, Dennis Carluzzo, wasn't on board. Dennis felt that Crockett and Gordon had too much control on the matter, and he feared that Crockett would be taking over like he once did, since Crockett was also a former NWA president. And thus, Carluzzo decided to personally oversee everything instead, which left Todd Gordon feeling disrespected. As a result, Gordon and Heyman planned to fire right back in the face of the NWA, and they wanted to do so while simultaneously bringing attention to ECW, as the promotion would now be setting out on its own, while also insulting the NWA, which had burned them. So they came up with a plan to have the tournament winner, the newly crowned NWA World Champion, to throw down the belt and declare that Extreme Championship Wrestling had arrived. But in order to pull this off the right way, they had to find the right guy to do it. And they found that guy in Shane Douglas. They assured him that the only repercussion would be the fallout from the old school purists who would be mad at him for being so disrespectful to the traditions of the National Wrestling Alliance. And that was the exact selling point that he needed, as Shane had been heavily criticized by Carluzzo, who viewed him as being unreliable. So now, the stage was set for ECW's ultimate act of defiance. There is more to this story, but I already did an episode on that, which you can check out afterwards for more info. Everything went off exactly as Heyman and Gordon had planned, with Carluzzo even saying after the event that Douglas would be NWA champion whether he likes it or not, and that he would move to have him stripped of both the NWA and the Eastern Championship titles. Todd Gordon responded to this by saying that he folded NWA Eastern Championship Wrestling and replaced it with Extreme Championship Wrestling, and that Shane Douglas was their ECW World Champion, as well as inviting the best wrestlers from all around the world to come and compete for that belt. Belt. Then in 1995, Gordon would sell the company to Paul Heyman, but he would remain on as a figurehead until 1997 when he would leave the company. Why did he leave? Well, this is where we entered the speculation station, because depending on who you ask between Heyman, Gordon, and others, you might get completely different stories. So for now, let's just go over a few scenarios. 
The most common story that you hear is that Gordon was a WCW mole who was secretly making deals to pillage the ECW locker room and send them to World Championship Wrestling. Because of this, some claim that Paul Heyman fired Gordon, while others say that Todd resigned of his own volition as a result of the accusation. On screen, Todd was written off a of TV by giving the explanation that he simply retired. And of course, there are also other completely different versions as to what happened, with numerous other individuals all serving as potential suspects, as well as those who say that there there was no mole in ECW to begin with. And quite frankly, this subject really could get a video all unto itself. Now, moving forward, ECW under Paul Heyman was growing and changing wrestling in ways that had never been done before. At this point, it had been considered taboo to show things like the backstage area. Heyman did that. It had also been considered taboo to show wrestlers drinking on screen. Heyman did that, and in addition, it was considered wrong to feature bad language, adult-themed storylines, and extreme violence, all of which Heyman did. And as it turns out, it was the exact thing that the aging little hokomaniacs that were now entering adolescence were craving, as well as older fans who were tired of the family-friendly environment that professional wrestling had become. Paul E. put it this way, in the 80s, you had your hair bands. Then, in the 90s, along came Nirvana and grunge music. The way he saw it, wrestling needed its Nirvana and ECW was there to answer the call. Heyman booked with a simple philosophy, accentuate the positives and hide the negatives. Why try and compete with WCW and the WWF's big budgets for things like pyro and projector screens when you don't have the same bankroll and any attempt you make to replicate it would look like you're doing a cheap imitation, because you are. So instead, don't bother with the bells and whistles, and instead, just focus on doing what you can do better than anyone else. And with this mentality, Heyman's style of booking became known for its ability to take any talent and turn them into a star. It didn't matter what your look was or even your in-ring ability. If you were dedicated enough, he would find a way to utilize you and get you over where no one else could. No matter how many wrestlers would leave for other companies after Heyman made them a star, Paul E. was always able to make new ones. Heyman even brought in wrestlers from all around the world, Japan, Mexico, Canada, not to mention that ECW also had Kurt Angle first before he ever set foot in a WWE ring. ECW was looking to diversify wrestling in the United States by showing showcasing different styles that local audiences had never seen before. And of course, that also included wrestling to the extreme. Now originally, the subheader of hardcore wrestling meant hardcore as an hardcore fan, having a strong dedication to the art of professional wrestling. The no DQ aspect was supposed to be known as extreme wrestling, but people confused the two, and hardcore simply became the more commonly accepted phrase, with even ECW itself taking it on as the official term. Now, just like with my video on CZW, the violence really does steal focus, so while I do have to mention it, I personally prefer to put more emphasis on the other aspects of ECW, as the company was so much more than that, and a lot of it just tends to get overlooked. The violence was so overshadowing that it has been said that ECW had a hard time making air, because people thought it wasn't the scripted kind of wrestling that WWF was. And remember, back then, even the UFC had a hard time putting on shows. As a result, ECW would end up airing very late at night after the FCC was watching, albeit mostly on local Philadelphia cable stations, until branching out to other areas like New York and Pittsburgh. Then, ECW's first major break when it came to large-scale exposure came from a surprising source, Vince McMahon and the World Wrestling Federation. I know, whenever I do these History of videos, WWE usually ends up being the bad guys, but hey, they did right for once. At least for now. As the story goes, Vince McMahon allegedly first became aware of ECW during the 1995 King of the Ring that took place in Philadelphia, where the fans were chanting ECW, and this put the company on Vince's radar. Then, in September of 1996, at In Your House Mind Games, also in Philly, ECW talent invaded the WWF event, which launched an angle between both promotions. This provided the necessary exposure for ECW ahead of their first ever pay-per-view on April 13, 1997, which was main evented by Terry Funk, who defeated Raven to become the ECW World Champion. Now, over the next couple years, and things would be very good for the company, as they would see their pay-per-view buy rates over double, and they would also get some of their most highly attended shows. This also included RVD's 700-day run as ECW Television Champion, the Dudley's dominance of the tag team division, as well as Taz's run at the top, and so much more. Not to mention the excellent commentary from the legendary Joey Styles and the company working to establish the ECW Arena as the historic building that it's become today. 
However, the good times would not last forever. With WWF and WCW ruling the roost, a lot of people were expecting professional wrestling to operate on a national level, thus making it much harder for a local promotion to stay afloat. Which meant things like video games, pay-per-views, and national television, not to mention retaining talent and keeping them from leaving for the top two companies, which could easily afford to offer them more money. This all came with a pretty hefty price tag, which meant that ECW would have to make more money, something that flew in the face of what the company was built upon, the principle of doing the best you can with what you have and not trying to match gigantic budgets. And to make matters worse, Paul Heyman is notoriously not the best businessman, nor is he known for delegating or trusting others with responsibilities. Paul E. took a lot upon himself when it came to making ECW a nationwide company, and unfortunately, one of his decisions included signing ECW with TNN. The Nashville Network, as it was known at the time, took on ECW programming in August of 1999. The hope was that since it was available across the country on cable, it could provide a bigger audience that in turn would order their pay-per-views as well as allowing for greater commercial revenue. However, this turned out to not be the case, as TNN didn't advertise ECW television properly and most people didn't know when the show was even on. Then, after poor ratings, TNN canceled ECW on October 6, 2000, and ECW Hardcore TV aired for the last time on December 30th of that same year. TNN would rebrand as Spike TV and would start airing WWF Raw instead, which some believe was the the goal all along, as instead of ECW using TNN to go national, TNN was using ECW to prove that they could host a wrestling show and get the WWF as well as shedding their own regional image. ECW's final pay-per-view guilty as charged was held on January 7th, 2001, and the last ECW event of any kind happened six days later in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Living Dangerously was scheduled for March 11th of that year, but was canceled. Then in April, amidst mounting financial troubles, ECW would officially close its doors. And while it would live on to some degree after it was acquired by Vince McMahon, things would definitely never be the same again. Extreme Championship Wrestling's legacy would live on even to this day with fans still occasionally chanting those three letters when something hardcore happens. Paul E is still just as over with fans as he ever was as well as companies like Ring of Honor being formed in its wake and CCW picking up the extreme mantle. Paul Heyman and ECW's gritty, grungy presentation of professional wrestling gave birth to WWF's Attitude Era, the popularity of hardcore wrestling in the United States, and loads of talents having great careers in the business who all first cut their teeth by going to the extreme. For many, it was more than a mere wrestling company, it was a statement. The promotion developed a cult-like following that no promotion had ever seen before, but every promotion has wanted ever since. It was hardcore, it was extreme, it was ECW. Well, there you go. The history of Extreme Championship Wrestling. What are some of your favorite ECW moments? Let me know down in the comments. And please make sure that you're subscribed to this channel and that you give this video a big like. Thank you so much for watching. And as always, Dave knows.